Buenas noches a todos. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza. Our Friday night, every other Friday night, of course, we have Dan Guerrero Happy Hour with a special guest, Eduardo Diaz, director of the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Latino Center. Welcome, everybody. En Casa con la Plaza, this is our virtual programming, doing it two, three, four times per week. The best of our community, history, art, culture, from our homes to yours via presentations, demonstrations, performances, and conversations. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the comment section to let us know where you're viewing from. Hey, excuse me, let me uh, finish that off. I didn't, all of you out there, you know, this is live. And so all these things happen, but you could hear me. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please make comments, ask questions, start a watch party. I'm gonna be doing this soon, myself. Again, it's the happy hour. And I'd like to introduce you, let you know about our happy hour host, the host with the most who's been doing these 17 times. This is his 18th. Dan Guerrero, an award-winning producer of diverse programming for network cable TV, live art and culture concert events. He's held talk shows, music specials for NBC, PBS, HBO, Univision, Telemundo, and he's directed large scale concert events at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, among other prestigious events, including La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. This is his 18th happy hour. He's had guests, Charro, Linda Ronson, Luis Perez, Los Lobos, Luis Perez of Los Lobos, Lucy Arnez, Lalo Alcaraz, and so many more, the list goes on. But enough about Dan. Now let's bring him up and he'll talk about his guest for tonight. Come on up, Dan. Hey, even I'm impressed with me. That there was you fun. <laughs> Unmute yourself, please. And I, you know, when I hear things like that, I feel, well, no wonder I'm so exhausted. No say, oh yeah, you're mute. I hit, I hit, I hit, I hit it. I, I. Again, this is live. And so we have Dan, I'm gonna ask him to unmute. I unmuted. These things happen because we are live. Of a lot of the weekend. This we is the first time Dan. we're trying this. We can hear Dan. Okay, oh, I, from Denise Arellano to everyone, I can hear him. Okay, Dan, it seems like I can't hear you. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, just let you go and go ahead and. Oh my God. Introduce your guest, Eduardo Lopez. Eduardo Lopez, you changed guests on me too. I, I know you got the vaccine. Obviously, it's not doing well by you so far. Well, hey, hey, everyone, this is live, more or less. Thanks for Zooming in or Facebooking in or whatever it is you're doing. We've had quite a couple of weeks, huh? But we're here. Um, campus, the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque. I love Albuquerque. And before that, he was the longtime director of cultural affairs for the city of San Antonio, another place I love. I don't love either of them as much as I love my home state and my home city of Tucson. So don't send me no hate mail from the Pueblo, okay? Um, and since 2008, he has indeed been the director of the DC-based Smithsonian Latino Center. He's a fascinating guy, he really is. And he's a fantastic salsa dancer. So please welcome my very special guest, Eduardo Diaz. Eduardo, you're gonna zoom in? Hi, hi, uh, hi, Dan. Hey, how are you? Thanks are so you? much. I know it's sleepy time in DC, huh? Yeah, it's but, getting uh, past my bedtime over here. <laughs> but listen, mijo, you've been in the thick of it in that city these last two weeks. Wow, have you pretty yeah, much I'm been- I'm so happy that we've reached Friday. Um, it's been quite a week. It's been quite a couple of weeks, and uh, you know, now that the inauguration took place a couple of days ago, and now we're seeing the National Guard finally leave. Yeah, they were guarding a park. A it, block it was surreal. Park. It was like we were watching the news of another country for the yeah, last uh, week. It's pretty pretty intense, but I'm glad it's over, and uh, 
hopefully well, it's not over but uh, i think it will be i think i'm very happy with the uh who we've got going and uh especially kamala that woman's not kitty <laughs> no one's going to get away with nothing with her at the helm so anyway but let, let's move on to to other things you know it's so interesting because uh we don't we do know each other a long time um, and this is my honor to have our friendship uh, but um so many of my guests seem to have these light bulb moments about their careers. You know, I was just a kid and my grandmother took me to an art show and I thought, I want to paint. Or, or I went to the theater and I saw, you know, a play and I, I doubt very much you were a kid saying, I want to be an arts administrator when I grow up. You know, so you kind of took a turn because you actually uh, have a law degree from uh, UC Davis. So tell us how you made this little uh, journey. Well, I, I, you know, I was uh, involved with the Chicano Law Students Association at uh, UC Davis. I've been active in the Chicano movement for, you know, when I was at San Diego State. Uh, I was president at the time of, um, you know, Chicano Park, the establishment of Chicano Chicano Studies at, U at San Diego State. So I've been an activist. My parents were activists in San Bernardino where I grew up. Um, my mother's on the school board. My father taught school as well. So I, you know, it was very normal for me to stay active in community matters. Um, and so while I was a student at UC Davis, I thought that I was going to be a lawyer because I thought it was a good way to, to help my, my community. Uh, but then I always had this, this notion about being involved in the arts and I always wanted to act. Um, and so when I was a third year student, I tried out for a play called Regalos de Tristeza. It was written by Manuel Pickett, who was a playwright for uh, Teatro uh, Campesino. Um, and I got the part of a 80 year old grandfather at, at the theater department at Sacramento State. And then, so that kind of got the, bit me a little bit, you know, the bug. And then I was in charge of recruiting uh, for UC Davis Law School. I mean, we were competing for Chicano and Chicano, other Latina and Latino law students with, you know, Berkeley or, you know, Hastings College of Law or Stanford or UCLA or whatever. And so my job was to uh, go and recruit Chicanas and the Latinos to come to the UC Davis Law School, which was, was at the time the newest of the law schools of the UC system. And uh, one thing led to another and I thought, wow, this is really very nice. You know, I, I really enjoy this work with media and whatnot. And after I graduated from law school, I decided that I really didn't want to pursue law and wanted to stay in the media and do work in the radio and in television. And that's what I did part, you know, for a while. And then I just, one thing led to another and I became involved as, you know, working in the arts field and, and cultural management and whatnot. And that's where I've been the rest of the, and they say the rest is history, right? And it, it, and it, and it was, is. It was funny as an aside, I was, I've been writing, I just wrote a, I've been writing uh, letters of uh, recommendation for students. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about it later with Michael Soto, but for a student who graduated from, East LA College, who's part of our program, and I'm, she wants to be an arts administrator, and she's applying to the Claremont Graduate Center. They're in Claremont, uh -huh. California, uh -huh. which has a very an incredible arts administration program at the graduate school level. And I was just shocked. I thought there was nothing like that when I was that that uh -huh. age. Yeah. No, nothing. And I'm just thinking, wow, we've come a long way. You know, she's applying to she's applying to school at Columbia University in New York City, and she's applying to this program in Claremont. Uh, and I thought, wow, what if we would have had a program like that when you know I was her age or thinking about or when, when, I, when I was in school, there was no Chicano studies, not, yeah. none of that at all. Well, it's just so, amazing to see that I've been around long enough now. You know, uh, having just I just turned seventy, and it's like, wow, this is really amazing. Um, so anyway, that's how kind of I didn't mean to go off to uh, face there a little bit, but um, it's just when you're when you when I now have the perspective that I have that you realize how far we've come, not only as a field, but how far we've come as a people in this in this in this work. Um, so uh, you know, I want to thank thank you for this invitation, and I see that some folks that I know, Barbara Carrasco and, yeah. and others are uh, are on uh, Harry Gambo, and others are are, are yeah. checking it out. So greetings to everyone. Yeah. I see Steve Wong is there. So uh, I love LA. My father from Boyle was from Boyle Heights. My family has deep roots there on my father's side. So um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. I uh, we have come a long way, and you know it's really important to celebrate that because 
we still have so far to go, as we know, and, and sometimes you get bogged down in that. You know, I, I personally, I'm always pissed, like the first Latino center or the first, I'm like, really? 2021 and we're having the first anything Latino, it, it, yeah. you know, yes, I'm happy. I'm also pissed, but that's a whole other show. Now, I, I, I did read somewhere where, uh, yes, you did not become a lawyer, but you, you, it was not wasted, the degree in law, because you use it every day in, in your work. Yeah, I know how to read and write. Pretty well. <laughs> well, I was thinking a little deeper than that, <laughs> but you know. Yeah, you know. no, it's very good training. Uh, you know, it's an, it's an analytical field, right? And so you have to break down a lot of, um, uh, you know, information and, and you do have to know a little bit about the political process and, and, and really know sharpening your research skills and your reading skills and your, and your ability to articulate and, and advocate. Um, Every once in a while, the Smithsonian lawyers uh, humor me and, and ask me to review a, a contract or something. Uh -huh. uh, and so I get a big thrill out of that. I get to play <laughs> for about uh, 30 minutes or so. But um, no, it's, it's, it's good training. I highly recommend it for those who are really serious about, about going into the law. It's funny, you know, I am actually, believe it or not, I, I support UC Davis Law School every year financially, even though I don't practice. The dean of the law school, um, Kevin Johnson, is a friend, um, and then, believe it or not, I am on the uh, I am on the a board of alumni of the alumni association of UC Davis. I am the only non lawyer on that. Wow. On that board. Yeah. So uh, they have a good immigration they have an immigration clinic. I'm real proud of UC Davis because they're at the forefront. If you want to study and be an immigration lawyer, the best school in the country. And is it to promote Latino presence within the Smithsonian. And uh, you, of course, have been the head of it since 2008. So tell us about the center and about some of the things they promote. And I, I know it doesn't have a physical location. It's not like you go to that for a right. museum. How, how does that work? How does all that work? Sure, I'll go, I'll go back to a report that was, that was issued in 90, 1994 called Willful Neglect, which was a pretty damning report on what the Smithsonian had not been doing, frankly, to represent the contributions of the Latino community in building this country or towards building this country and shaping its national culture. It was a very hard report. I'm glad you know the Smithsonian realized that it was blowing it, if you will. And um, so the Latino Center was established in 97, as you said, to enhance the representation of the Latino community and our contributions to building the country and shaping culture. Uh, and it's not an easy task. So there are 19 museums of the Smithsonian, nine research centers, there's a record label, the National Zoo. So there's a lot of territory to cover. Um, and so our task is really to um, represent the Latino community and, and establish presence for our community within the institution. So we support research, exhibitions, collections, uh, public and educational programs, digital or online uh, programs as well as publications. And we also are very uh, involved with bringing or developing the next cadre of Latino and Latinos in, in the museum field. And I know we're gonna talk with Michael uh, later on in the program. Right, right. So, um, you know, that's really the job that, um, that's the job of the center is to represent, right? And so we work uh, across the units of the Smithsonian, whether they're archives or whether they're the National Museum of American History or American Art or the National Portrait Gallery or the, the, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York City. Uh, so American Indian Museum, of course, uh, African American History and Culture as well, which is important because 25% of our community identifies as Af Afro Latin, as African descended. So, yeah. um, you know, that's an obviously a huge part of our community that we need to make sure that we're also representing in an adequate manner. So that's in essence, um, the, the program. You, you're right, we don't have a physical presence, although we're working on one now, and that's the Molina Gallery, and we're gonna talk about that later. So that's essentially um, the work that we do. I would guess that, you, first of all, you must have 2000 meetings a day, but I would imagine every day must be a completely different scenario and a completely different, uh, 
uh, uh, I don't know what, um, I have no words. So let's show a picture because one of these photos, uh, can we see, yeah, this is, uh, tell us what this is. I believe yeah. that's Munoz and tell us about this. Yeah, this is, uh, this is at the apartment right above MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, Midtown Manhattan um, on the east side. This is, uh, we're having a meeting where we're talking about the Molina Gallery and it's kind of a pitch, uh, a pitch, um, a pitch. Yeah, pitch meeting. Yeah, so I have board members on the other side of me and we're making an introduction to possible supporters uh, in New York City uh, of, the, of the Molina Gallery. So that's, you know, it was, uh, Henry's got a great place in New York. It looks uh, nice. I thought, you know, I thought it was some office building. It's his bloody apartment. That uh, no, he's San Antonio uh, based, isn't he? Uh, he's from San Antonio, right? Uh, yes, he's from originally from San Antonio, but he has uh, he's very active on the East Coast. He has uh, a home in Washington D.C. Was very involved, of course, with the Democratic National Committee, and then he has this place in New York City. So, and a know, major, got, major, major collection of of, of Latino art. Major collection of of of. of Mostly Tejano artists, also from California as well. But uh, yeah, good and, guy. And, and we have another photo of you here addressing. Uh, tell us about this. Uh, let's see. Right. Uh, again, this is my board, and I am presenting. This is the basically the uh, floor plan for the Molina Family Latino Gallery in an earlier stage. This is. This looks like it's probably thirty-five percent of design or so. Things have shifted since then, but. You know, the process for developing this gallery has been uh, quite a process. I never thought that building out a 4,500 square foot gallery would be so involved. Um, but if you want to do it right, you, 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 you know, it does take that uh, amount of time and it is complicated. Okay. It's all complicated. Your work also, which I find fascinating, that's why I, I, I'm sure you have no time to do any salsa dancing anymore, because you also are an advisor on all things Latino to government agencies and, and, and to Congress. And, and you addressed uh, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, back in 2019 about the long-awaited National Museum of the American Latino. Right. Uh, we'll get to that in one second, too. But uh, I loved and, and I read I read the address and it was very impressive, I have to say. But I love this, what, what you said, um, if I may quote you. Um, if the Smithsonian is to fully serve 21st century global audiences through in-person visitation and digital outreach strategies, we will have to be more inclusive, more accessible, and more diverse. And then you added US Latino history is American history. Ain't that the truth? Yes. Yes, our, our job is really to center the Latino experience as part of the U.S. Ex experience period. Uh, Latino art is American art. What part of that do you not understand, right? Uh, Latino history is American history. Portraits of Latinas and Latinos are portraits of Americans. Um, design, you know, fashion designers, graphic designers who happen to be Latino or Latina are American designers, period. It's, it's, you know, so it's not, there's no caveats, there's no if or buts or no. No, we're part of this narrative and that's, and that's the end of that. So, the, so we've been marginalized for a long time. So part of our job is to center that margin so that it's not a margin anymore. Uh, a good many years ago, I produced uh, uh, a night of Chicano and Tex-Mex music in Paris at the Cité de la Musique. And I took dad and I took Flaco Jimenez. Yeah. And my favorite thing about the experience, it was part of a three-day festival of American music. So in Paris, they quite assume that Chicano and Tex-Mex music is American music. Right. It's a little right. harder here, which is maybe why it took 25 years to finally get the, the passage of, and just last December, for the new American, uh, uh, the National Museum of the Latino American. And I, we could spend a week just talking on why it took 25 yeah. years, but I have two images here that I think set it up well, if we can see that, um, Abelardo. Okay, Senator Lee, Republican Utah. The last thing we need is an array of separate but equal museums. That's maybe not surprising, but this next one was a little more surprising to me. 
Senator Menendez, who's part of the whole uh, museum, they're Democrat, we have been systematically excluded, not because this senator says so, I assume he's referring to Lee, but because the Smithsonian itself said so. The only righteous way to end that e exclusion is to pass this bill. And you're in the middle of all that, trying to create this presence. Yes, we are. The museum bill passed, and now it comes to us, to the Smithsonian, uh, to not only to build this museum, but we have twins, right? We were presented with twins because now we have to build also uh, a National Women's History Museum at the same time. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Uh, hey, you know, hey, it keeps you young, keeps you young. I'm telling you. You know, I mean, building museums is what we do, as we know, the National Museum of African American History and Culture opened in September of, uh, wow, when did it open now? It's been a while, and I'm losing uh, it. I, I, yeah, uh, five it? years? Uh, 16, 2016, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, and that took 13 years from the point of enactment to the time that they cut the ribbon. So. We're about to begin a quite a quite a journey. Um, this next year is going to be, uh, or the year we're in now, uh, that we just entered here in January. It's going to be quite a. We're going to try to do our best to set up. In fact, we've got no funding from the federal government for this new, no new funding from the federal government. Wait, say that again. You got no new funding. Yeah, the bill called the original bill that was that was passed had language in there that, that was supposed to appropriate $20 million in fiscal year 21, which is what we're in right now. Uh, but the appropriators at the end of the day decided that they uh, could not provide any support to the Smithsonian and new monies to get the ball rolling. So we went from 20 million in the bill to zero. That's quite a hit going from 20 million to zero dollars. So uh, we're having to uh, scurry around a bit and try to find some funds to at least do a couple of things or three things maybe, or maybe four things if we can, which is one to select a new director of the museum, which will um, a search for national search will start um, pretty soon really, uh, select a site where we're gonna put the museum on the mall. And third uh, to um, build a, a board uh, to name and put together a board of trustees as is called for in the legislation and then if we're lucky, um, I'm hoping that we can also uh, put together a, um, uh, an advisor, a group of advisors, scholarly advisors, right, on the museum that will help guide us in terms of programming for the museum in, in, over the long term. So if we can do those four things with the funds we do have, then I think we can uh, state the case to, to the government uh, or to the federal, to Congress. Congress is on the hook for the money that's it's this year they just didn't appropriate but they're on the hook the bill says it's a 50 50 proposition 50 percent of the funding for the museum coming from the federal government and 50 percent coming from private sources of revenue and there's language in the bill that says and the congress shall support or is authorized to appropriate such funds as are necessary so congress is on the hook to appropriate funds over the long term to build out the museum. It's just that they decided uh, that this year they really couldn't. And I, I understand, you know, the optics of, of allocating a large sum of money to support a museum when people are food insecure, getting evicted from their homes, dealing with COVID, you know, economic situation uh, in such a dire situation, you know, I get it. I, I, you know, I understand uh, a museum could be viewed and and probably rightfully so as a luxury in some ways when people. But are the suffering. truth is, even before pandemics and before all of this, the arts are always the first to get cut. Yeah, I mean, when, right. when I was in grade school in what fourteen thirty seven. We had music appreciation class. I remember the teacher played a harpsichord. I thought it was the most incredible thing I'd ever heard, you know? Uh, all those programs, well, they went away thousands of years ago. Yeah, yeah you're right. But th these, are, these are extraordinary times that we're living in right oh, now. no question. That nobody no question. could have predicted or nobody knows. I know. I mean, the I impact know. and the scope of, the, of what's happening right now is just, and you know, I'm, you in LA, I'm, and look at what's going on in LA with COVID right now. I mean, it's just, I don't have to tell you that. Uh, and, and the homeless, the homeless situation is yeah. just beyond 
anything. So, so the situation is, is very difficult yeah. right now to negotiate, but we'll, we're going to make it. Uh, we must think positively. We must oh, think positively. You know how to be resilient, if nothing else. Hey, Chicanadas, you can't kill us. You can't kill us. You can't get rid of us. Let's talk, we brought it up several times, the Molina, uh, the Molina Family Gallery, which seems like a beautiful, and that's much farther along and funding and all that. And yeah. tell us about that. We have a couple of, I think we have sure. a couple of the, renderings. You know, the efforts to establish the, the museum uh, began in 2011 when a commission uh, submitted a report to Congress and then President Obama. What you saw there was the uh, part of the uh, exhibition uh, area of the Molina Gallery. We decided at the, at the Latino Center, you know what? Um, we don't know what's going to happen with this museum legislation. Because like I said, you know, it took eight years even to get a committee hearing <clears throat> excuse me, for the bill. And I told the staff, I said, you know what, let's go ahead and see if we can plant the flag, right? Let's just go ahead and um, and see what we can do to, uh, yeah, this is the Molina family, actually. Uh, let's go ahead and, uh, this is the Eli interns now. But wow, the, Abelardo uh, is on speed. Hold, hold off, uh, yeah, Abelardo. Not before was the M Molina family. But at any rate, we decided, you know what, let's go ahead and build a gallery. Let's start modestly and where where is this gallery it's, it's going to be at the national museum of american history on the national mall uh -huh. on the first floor of the east wing and we went shopping around felt like i was a gypsy looking for a home you know, like <laughs> we went shopping if you will um so we identified a couple two or three spaces options but we settled on american history because we really are part of american history yes. and thought, that would be the most appropriate place. So we found a 4,500 square foot that the museum had been using. Are you ready for this? For storage. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Oh. I, I don't even want to go there, okay? No, so, let's not, let's not. Uh, so, let's not. Uh, yeah. So anyway, we, uh, we uh, hijacked the space and um, started planning and we're looking around for money because we knew it was going to be an expensive proposition. This is a $25 million project wow. right? There over 10 years, at least over 10 years of being there at the museum or that we intend to be there. And we're going to be there longer, I think, given the how long it's going to take to build a museum. But um, through our, one of our board members who we saw in an earlier pic picture, uh, Roel Campos, who's a lawyer here in town, a corporate lawyer, lawyer originally from South Texas, but now living here in the DC area, we identified he was friends with the Molina family. Right, and this is the sons and daughters of Dr. C. David Molina, which is the a Molina healthcare, healthcare, a healthcare empire. Right, um, C. David Molina was born in Yuma, Arizona, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and um, became a teacher. Uh, moved to Long Beach, um, married an Italian woman by uh, the name of Mary. They settled in Long Beach. She was also a teacher, and then he decided that he wanted to become a doctor and went to what is now UC Irvine. Um, Irvine was a medical school, I believe, before it really became a full-blown you know, UC, um, and graduated and uh, was a general practitioner in emergency medicine. And he noticed that a lot of black and brown folks were coming into the emergency room who really didn't have emergencies, but had no other place to go to get medical care. And he had an idea. I said, what if I start a clinic a community-based clinic that'll serve these populations, right? And, you know, he had a hard time getting financing because while he was a doctor, he was also a Mexican and he had difficult time getting a bank loan, but he finally did, established a clinic, which then led to six clinics, 12 clinics, 24 clinics, and then eventually the Molina Healthcare, which traded as a Fortune 500 company on the stock market. So. Those um, uh, at that, not not to interrupt, but I will. That trajectory kind of reminds me of Cato de la Rocha with Altamed Health Services out here servicing the community. And he started it from a storefront, and now it's huge. He's also a huge collector of Chicano. Correct. Art. So yeah, um, and so you know they had five children, two two medical doctors, uh, a lawyer, 
an architect and um, a person, in, uh, the youngest daughter who is involved with arts and education, all in the city of Long Beach, California. And um, they each decided to make a major gift. And that was really, really got the ball start, got the ball rolling. And that is why the, the name of the gallery carries the Molina name, right? Um, so, and then from there, you know, some of the more important corporations that we all know, Target, Bank of America, Disney and whatnot started coming in as well as funders. And, you know, we've raised about $17 million to the cause now. Wow. So we're, we're doing quite well. Um, feel good about it. And the gallery should open uh, next May. It, knock on wood, you know, obviously we're dealing with a pandemic. Uh, there have been, you know, interruptions in the supply chain of materials, construction materials and whatnot. And, you know, if one of the construction workers comes down with a virus, there you know, you go. Then we go in and then we have an issue to deal with. And so if everything works out, we should be opening next spring again. But I, I always say, you know, the caveat is the pandemic, right? It's, you just yeah. don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the exhibitions? Will it be art and what? Mostly a his, we're in the History Museum. So it's really more of a focus on history, although we will be incorporating artists in actually creating pieces in the space itself. And we will be using art to tell history. So there's a little bit of art in there, but it's the focus is really telling a historical narrative. And the first exhibition is called Presente, a Latino history of the United States. We really wanted to open up with um, kind of a Latino 101 kind of an uh -huh. approach. Uh -huh. You have to understand that the majority of the visitors to that museum are non-Latinos. And many of them will not know much about us, right? It's, you know, it's John and Mary from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and they're, or God, of course, Hope Sioux Falls in South Dakota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, let's put out here with that. <laughs> let's play, yeah. let's be safe here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Minneapolis and their 2.5 kids, right? So, you know, they may not know much about us. Uh, you know, their son may know Juanito, who's, you know, going to the same elementary school and, you know, Taco Bell, and then maybe that's it, you know? So, um, you know, of course I'm exaggerating, but, you know, we have to understand that many of the visitors aren't gonna know much about us. So I think it was an important thing for us to start with an exhibition that really laid it out. Uh, I, I agree I, totally. And you know what the truth is? A lot, of, a lot of Latinos don't know our history. Let's be real. A lot of them don't know our history. They don't know our heroes, the people whose shoulders we all stand on, you know? So, um, so imagine a non-Latino, that's like we arrived from uh, Jupiter. Yeah. So we started out there uh, and then we'll go on to, um, we'll go on to exhibitions about Latino youth movements. We'll probably deal with, uh, so we'll deal with, you know, the walkouts in LA, of course, the Chicano movements, the Young Lords, the struggles of young Cubans in Miami to against English only and the struggle for bilingual education, et cetera, et cetera. School desegregation cases we'll deal with. So, and then we'll move on to other more, more specific subjects could be in the uh, military service, uh, you know, and Latino community. It, it's a, there's a broad range, so. Oh, but it's, that's fantastic. And yeah. it's real and it's soon. I it's mean, we don't have to space. wait 20 years to cut a ribbon. Exactly. It will open next year. So, um, and we've also made, and this is important to me personally, and I think to the community generally, we've made a real commitment to inclusive design, meaning that those visitors who have a physical challenge or are blind or have a visual impairment of some kind, or who are deaf or have a hearing, also hearing impairment, we have designed the space um, using a good deal of technology to create an environment for those visitors who have special needs. Because I didn't want to say, oh, well, it's accessible. You can push your wheelchair through it. That's no, that's no, that's not going to do. We want to make sure that a person who has, who's uh, has low vision, you know, the graphics are designed in a way the color contrast. So the person that has low vision has less problems reading if they can read or if they're completely blind we have uh, universal access points where they can get to uh, screen readers there we even have cane sweep so if you're using a cane and you bump into something along the ridge of the floor you'll know that there's something for you there in terms that you can use your cell phone 
to to uh, the QR code that you know you and you know there's an orientation center at the beginning of the galleries. Anyway, we're trying to do what we can to make it as accessible as possible. Yeah, uh, you know that's that's the thing. Technology. I mean, Lord. So if a museum opened five years ago, some of it is already obsolete with what museums can do today. I mean, you, you'd have to open a museum every day to get everything you want. Right. So. Uh, uh, and I just had a talk today with somebody about that, but that's another story. This whole thing, and, and I'll, I, I can't wait. I, I, I'll come, if, if we can fly in planes safely, I'm gonna come for the opening of the morning. Well, so. Next year, year 20, uh, 22, May, June Yeah, we'll we should be, be good. Fine. Yeah, save me a seat. Okay. Um, I, I, all the programs you have, but one very near and dear to my heart. I really want to make sure and do this. And uh, and it is the Smithsonian Undergraduate Internship Program between the Latino Center and the Vincent Price Art Museum on the East LA College campus. That's not the photo. So let's get the photo of VPAM. Yeah, that's that's actually the construction wall. Right. Uh, for the gallery. And those are the three interns and Michael is one of them. Right. Um, right. I think we have a, a there you go. That That's is the Vincent Price. Price Art Museum. Right. I am very proud of this for two reasons. First of all, I'm an ELAC graduate. And uh, and when I was going there, there was a teeny tiny Vincent Price Art Gallery. And now all these years later, he donated a great deal of art. We have this beautiful museum and I am on the board of trustees and the board is watching tonight. You all better be watching this tonight. So this program is fantastic. It started just in, in, in 2018. I think you yeah. spearheaded it with Pilar Tompkins Rivas, yeah. who was our then director, who we love and we miss. Uh, she is now um, chief curator and deputy of the universe for the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. So we were happy for the gig, but we do miss her. And the two of you did this program, which I believe is unique. So tell us all about it. You know, we've been operating a program called the Latino Museum Studies Program since 94, actually, at the Latino Center, way before I got there. And this was a program, a summer program for uh, emerging Latin and Latino scholars, right? And museum professionals. <clears throat> and so the program's been quite successful. We have quite a few alums who now work at the Smithsonian and in other uh, museums, right? Um, for example, Gabriela Martin, um, Martinez, who is at uh, MOLA in Long Beach. Uh -huh. The head of their education program is an alum of our program, and I could go on. But at any rate, you know, I saw, I thought to myself, you know, some of these students that come to us, the grad students that come to us, you know, they make a decision, right? They're either going to stay in the academy, right? They're going right. to, go to the universities or colleges, or they're going to come into the museum world. And it's a bit of a crapshoot, you know, it's a toss up. You don't know what, where, where they're going to go, which way they're going to go, right? And so I thought, well, what if we get to try to get to the students at an earlier stage in their academic trajectory, right? undergraduate students, right? Um, you know, before they make any decisions and if we can kind of push them towards museum studies earlier on, the chances are better that when they get to the graduate level, if they want to go that far, that they'll gravitate towards museum work, right? And we will be able to create more opportunities and diversify the museum field in a way that it really does need to be diversified, right? And so I pitched the idea to Pilar because, you know, East LA College, again, recognize that the majority of Latinas and Latinos who are in college and post-secondary education are at the community college level. They're not at UCLA or UC Santa Barbara or Cal State Fullerton or whatever. They're at East LA College. They're at Glendale College. They're at City College. They're, you know, that's where they're at. And I figured, what if we start a program, a, you know, a modest internship program and bring students to the Smithsonian, introduce them to the museum field, have them work under some of our best professionals that we have at the Smithsonian. Um, and we started in 2018. And um, I have to say, it's been very uh, successful. In fact, the letters of recommendation that I'm writing that I mentioned earlier is for, uh, for Gabi Padilla, who just graduated from UC Berkeley in art history, who was one of the students that came in 2018. 
So we're starting to see the trajectory. Yeah, you're starting to see the, the result. In it, huh? You're seeing the result already. That's the results. Pretty, She's pretty be, quick turnaround. Yeah. So, but can I interject here that it was such a good fit too because VPAM, I believe, is the only uh, professional uh, uh, museum located on a community college campus within the Los Angeles uh, Community College uh, yeah. District. So it's also the only college that has a museum studies certificate program. Correct. Probably the only one in the country, I would imagine. Yeah. I have not heard of any other community college because the challenge with the museum studies field is that they're mostly graduate programs. They're not at the undergraduate level. And so what ELAC has done is really something quite extraordinary, quite it, extraordinary. Yeah, it's when I went to, to ELAC, there were Quonset huts, some of the classrooms. And when I walk on campus now, it is spectacular. It's, yeah. it's an amazing, amazing uh, 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 college and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the museum there, we're, we're, we're very proud of it. We have some photos here. Um, let me see what we have. Okay, this is some of the mentors uh, and, and some of the, uh, the cohorts, you call the, the interns uh, cohorts. Tell us uh, who's in that photo, Eduardo. This is Melissa Marinero, Gabi Padilla, and Vanessa Quintero from on the far left. These are the students from ELAC. Uh -huh. and, uh, Amalia Cordova, Susan Aides, uh, Eileen Graham, um, and I'm blanking out. Oh my God. Um, Oh my God, I know her name so well. She's a, an educator at the National, Beth Evans, thank you, oof, uh, at the National Portrait And I, I didn't write it down because I thought, oh, he'll remember who they oh are. Oh my so. God, this is like, <laughs> Anyway, they were terrific cohort. <laughs> Melissa has since graduated from uh, Long Beach State. Gabby, as I mentioned before, just graduated from UC Berkeley and is applying to grad school. And Vanessa, I believe, is at Cal State LA. So uh, it's all working out really nicely. And you know, this is really a pathway program, right? We're trying to create a pathway from East LA College and the Vincent Price Art Museum to wherever. It doesn't have to be the Smithsonian. We'd love for them to come to the Smithsonian when they're ready. Uh, but if they stay and work at the Getty or at MOLA or LACMA or yeah. any of the museums in the LA area, fine. Uh, that's that the goal is to get them on a path towards becoming museum professions, professionals. And, and what a great step for them. Like, again, things like that did not exist, you know, when you was, were in school or I was in school. We have another photo of, uh, of some of the cohorts because I, I think they, they do, a, it's a five week uh, internship. They do a week at ELAC, I mean, at, at ELAC at VPAM, and then they go to, to, uh, to DC. But do we have a photo there, Abelardo? Um, yeah. Okay. This okay. is this is, um, this is the this is 2019 students. 19, right? Yeah. And this is um, the Mexican this Institute. Fierro. This is <laughs> Alberto Fierro, who is the director, who was then the director of the Mexican Cultural Institute, right, in uh, in Washington D.C., three blocks from where I live, actually, and he's giving the students um, an explanation of the work of them. Mexican Cultural Institute. So, you know, uh, we, we bring one, they're here, we take them around, introduce them to leaders in the community. The first group we actually took to New York so they could go to the Met and- And the Coop, we have a photo whatever. of that at the Cooper uh, Hewitt, I believe. Yeah. That, that yeah. would- uh, here, This is at the Cooper Hewitt. This is right. Christina de Leon, who is the Associate Curator for Latino Design at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City on Fifth Avenue and 91st Street. So um, yeah, they, we have, we tried to create the oppor opportunities for them to, to meet and see things and really inspire them to want to say, you know what, I can do that. Sure. I want to do that. Sure. Um, and it's, and it's, um, yeah, we think we're on the right path. We just got a major grant from the Mellon Foundation and we're going to expand this program at, in, at Arizona State University, ah. New, Mexico, New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso, wow. and City College, New York. Um, and the latter, because we want to expand our inreach into the Afro-Latino community and, mm -hmm. and, and City College, New York, as you well know. Sure. <clears throat> because I know you lived in New York for a while. You, you know that you know, that's heading up towards Colum um, Washington Heights and, and up into the Upper West Side. So. Yeah, it's uh, 
we feel really good about it. We're, we're able to expand this program beyond ELAC, but ELAC is the, it's in metal model, right? It's, it's the, the best. It's, 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 the, it's the, the, the germ, right? That has, has grown this idea. And it's like the role model, if you will, or the, yeah, the best practice, let's put it that yeah. way. And this year, of course, you, you had to recreate or, or, or reinvent, I should say, because of the pandemic, because this year it's virtual. It's we have virtual. the 2020, uh, 2021, I guess. I feel so there, badly. There they are. There they are. I feel so badly. Uh, it is what it is. Um, and we're making the best out of it. What I love this year as well, it's important, is that Dominic Cervantes and uh, where is she? Allison uh -huh. said, uh, are actually at the National Gallery of Art this year, which is a major institution that's not a Smithsonian museum, but it's on the mall, right? Yeah, yeah. People often confuse it. They think it's a Smithsonian and it's don't, not. Don't take away that. Uh, give me that photo back, Abelardo, please. Can I get that last? Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Joseph Valencia and yep. to Natalie Sanchez, who um, I guess what's her, Natalie is the, is the interim education program coordinator and Joseph is the VPAM exhibitions and programs manager. And they have done a fantastic job. They're, they're young stars though too. And what they've created uh, right. virtually along with your team uh, is just, I, I just wanted to give them a shout oh, out. Absolutely, they're, they've been really great to work with uh, Nat Natalie and them. And Joseph. Joseph's been with us since the beginning, so yeah, he he's terrific, really well. And and um, we have we have a, a we have a live cohort that we're going to bring on. Michael Salto, who was a reentry uh, a student. Michael, can you zap in, zoom in, whatever it is? There you go. Good evening, gentlemen. Hi, how are you? Good, good, thank you. What's with the glasses? Are you? Uh, am I copying you? Or are you copying me? <laughs> I want to be able to see you guys. See what's going on? <laughs> Good idea. Tell us about. Tell us about. I mean, you're a reentry student, so you you were a little uh, older than than some of the other kids. But you you actually did it twice. What I can't even how to begin. What the experience? What did it do that? You know, it just must have fast tracked what you would have had to learn in a book or looking at films. You're there. Tell us about that yeah. experience. Well, um, I was part of the cohort um, for 2020. And um, like you said, as a reentry student, it was just such a great opportunity and a confidence builder to kind of pursue an art history um, degree and to kind of carve a pathway. And like, what, what was it gonna, where was I going to um, take this um, uh, degree and where was I gonna go? So also being part of the first cohort, um, uh, museum study certificate program at ELAC, it is, it's, it's just been so beneficial because like you're saying, these programs weren't available a few years ago. And kind of, um, you know, when I re-entered on this educational journey, I think that these programs are crucial to kind of help to, to figure it out. Especially being a re-entry student, I didn't really have, I don't really have a lot of time to figure these things out. I just want to get it done and pursue a career in a professional museum setting. So it was a great opportunity. And how are you keeping that momentum going? What is it you're doing now? Or are you on a little hiatus or what's what's happening now? Well, um, now I just finished um, uh, my last semester and I was able, fortunately, to take several classes to kind of just finish off my, um, my degree. And I'm starting the transfer process or I have finished the transfer process. So, you know, I'm applying to several different schools. UCLA is one of them, Davis. Um, uh, Long Beach, Fullerton, so several different schools. Um, I'll keep it local to work on my undergrad. And then, you know, in the future for graduate school, I'll think about maybe leaving the state. When I was first uh, getting this uh, talk together and and I always look for images and I, I they, and the uh, Latino Center sent me quite a few photos of cohorts, et cetera. And I kept looking and it was almost all female. You were almost the only male I saw and, and I, I I thought that was very interesting. And when I mentioned it to you, you had an interesting uh, answer, if you want to call it that. Tell us why you one of the few males. And that's one of the other um, the things, you know, I, I think that the odds are kind of stacked against me as far as, you know, being male, part of the LGBTQT plus community. I didn't see representation or enough of it. 
So I think that to kind of, you know, to get in there and to represent, I thought would be, it's just a great opportunity and now's the time to do it. And so I just feel that, you know. Um, but do you it, feel that more females or why aren't there more males? You know, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't answer that question. Well, then I um, wouldn't have brought you on if you weren't going to answer it. <laughs> I, I know, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure, you know, maybe, um, you know, instead of going into art history or people, males or, or men are usually going into um, studio arts. So they're, you know, more well, art. But you, you mentioned to me that the museum world and the ministers was mainly a white male domain. Correct. And, 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 you know, historically, you know, uh, museums have always been a white privileged space. So right. I think that, you know, the narrative is changing and that's something that, you know, is, is crucial to the future of museums. You know, it's, 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 um, it's more interactive now. It's not just like you go into yeah. a museum and you know, the dialogue is changing, you know, more representation, which is what we need, which is great. And you can be a part of it. Why did we lose Eduardo though? Eduardo though, we wanted you to stay and chit chat or maybe he had to go I'm to here. the loop. I'm here. You have I'm anything to say to Michael? Great. Pardon me? Anything to say to Michael or anything you remember no, about I, Michael? I think um, Michael is really, I think, almost typical of the students that we're seeing coming from East LA College who are reassessing what they want to do, right? And, you know, like this year, some of the students that are here in the program that we just saw, um, Dominic and the other students, Gloria Ortega and whatnot, you know, some of these students have already graduated from a four year. Right, uh -huh. but they're going back to East LA College. Why? Because it's the, the only place in LA that has a museum studies program <laughs> at the community wow. college level. Yeah. So you can say, wow, they're going backwards. No, actually, no, they're going forward, right? And so I think Michael, um, you know, is, is typifies the, the, the students that, that we get and it's, you know, and as far as the, the 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 gender imbalance, I don't know what to say because most of the curators that we work with at the Smithsonian are Latinas, the vast majority yeah, of them. And yeah. it's, so it's an almost endemic in the field. And and um, you know, obviously, we'd like to see more men to have a you know the, the, to balance things out, but it is what it is, you know. And so we go with the best. Sorry, guys. I mean, yeah. You know. Um, that's so, it. That's it. And um, yeah, but no, no, it's great. been great to have, have students like Michael come through. And I suspect we're going to see more, many more like Michael. You will. Because um, we really do need to set this, set the students on a pathway where they can see themselves as museum professionals. That's as long as you can see it, envision it and believe it. That's half the battle. Uh, the rest of, of, any, the of any profession you go into, I mean, you, you have to say, oh, I could do that if they did it, you know, look, that we all know that. So, Michael, thank you so much. I hope to meet you in person one day once all these cootie things go away. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. Eduardo, we're, we're going to go into our Q&A, uh, but before we do, I have to give a shout out to your sister, to Kathy. Kathy Diaz is a very uh, prominent lady here in L.A., uh, uh, at uh, uh, our beautiful KPFK, a uh, 90.7 FM with her music show. She's now doing the global, uh, what the hell is it called? Uh, Cause she's global. been for, huh? Global, global, global Village. Village. Right, right. Yeah. But for, for years she was doing- um, Canto Tropical. That's right. I I've had just a tiny little- love that. Yeah. yeah. She can shake her booty too. So we love her and Maggie Lapie at the KPFK. We love them there. Um, so we have some Q&A things. Uh, Abelardo, have you been collecting some interesting questions for our friend here? Sure. Hi. Uh, we have uh, from Maritza, Maritza Resinos. Can you name of the artists that will be represented at the, at the museum? What museum? The, the... Or at the center. Excuse me, the, the, the Smithsonian Latino Center. Can you speak? We, have, will be we have a couple of artists that are working, doing some actually in some design work. Um, one is um, a woman by the name of Veronica Castillo. She works, she does trees of life, you know, the ceramic trees oh, of life. Oh, yes. She's uh, originally from Puebla. She now lives in San Antonio for many, many years. She's a National Endowment for the Arts fellow, uh, widely recognized for the work that she does in clay with the trees of life. 
She's actually doing one in the section of the exhibition that deals with issues of social justice, right? Um, <clears throat> so she's doing the tree of life. That's not your typical Adam and Eve thing, okay? It's more, <laughs> it's more like Cesar. How, how, how large is it? How large is it? How large is it? The four. It's there's three uh, three costillas, no three ribs, if you will. Uh, four feet. It's pretty big. Oh, so four wow. feet. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ronald, <clears throat> Ronald Rael, who is an architect and designer, who is from uh, Southern Colorado, from the San Luis Valley, uh, which borders Northern New Mexico, of course, uh, and is also a professor in the Department of Architecture at UC Berkeley, is designing a, a kind of a sound wall that will also be bench seating. It's hard to explain. It's a huge installation. Uh, so he's doing that. Rafael Lopez, a very well-known illustrator, an artist and muralist uh, who lives in San Diego, I believe. And yes, I think it's in San Diego, um, is doing uh, some illustrations and also doing a, a kind of a chandelier lighting object in the learning lounge, which is part of the gallery. It's a space for intergenerational activities. Um, those are three artists that are actually designing in, um, in the space, the pieces that are designed in the, uh -huh. in the gallery space, right? Isabel, gosh, what's her last name? I believe it's Herrera, I could be wrong, is a Venezuelan born but New York City based illustrator um, who's also doing some work primarily graphic le hand lettering and, and, other, and other features in the gallery. So, those are some of the artists that are working as designers in the space. Uh, so that's you know those are that's a sample of of the artists we're working with. Yeah, another uh, question here is: Has the Latino Smithsonian Latino Center already mounted any exhibitions at at the Smithsonian Institute or any of the affiliated exhibits? And how, if so, how have them been? How have they been received? Yes, we have done a. Uh, five exhibits that I'm recalling right now. The last one we did was an exhibition on, 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 the, on Tainos, right? The Tainos, Tainos oh, are yeah. the people that quote unquote Columbus discovered, right? Uh, the Caribbean, <laughs> right? And yeah, so, they didn't know they were there until he told them. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they didn't, they were lost, right? Until he discovered them and told them. Oh, they were, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, you're in Puerto Rico. No, actually, we're in Bodinque. Okay, <laughs> get out of here. So, anyway, you know, we, so, we uh, have we have to laugh at these things. Otherwise, we'd be so livid all the time. You know. God. <laughs> so anyway, we did an exhibition at the National Museum of the American Indian in New York City, right? So, the National Museum of the American Indian has two main has two museums. The main one on the Mall in Washington, and the second one at the former U.S. Customs House in Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. No. And so we did the show there purposefully because almost 30% of New York of the New York City region is of Caribbean descent, right? Whether you're Jamaican, whether you're Haitian, whether you're Puerto Rican, Dominican, Cuban, whatever you are, that's like 30% of New York City's population. So <laughs> it was important for us to do it there. Before that, we did another program on Central American ceramics at the National Museum of the American Indian. We did a show on Latino music, uh, talking, you know, more in the field where, you know, a certain person by the, by the name of Lalo was involved with that show, Lalo Guerrero. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, we've done several shows, but that this one at the American History Museum with the Molina Gallery will be the one where we doing it in our space. Because the rest of the time we've been right. around, running around like gypsies trying to find space, right? Oh. And now we have our own and that makes a huge difference. All right. Excuse me, Dan. I'm sorry. I was going to say Cheech is, is my next uh, happy hour guest week after next. And uh, of course, he's got the, the, the museum in Riverside opening. So you guys have been talking about. Yeah, we are doing the we're the, actually the first show that's one of the first show that's going there is of the work of the De La Torre brothers, Ainar and Hamex De La Torre, who you are probably are well known there in Southern California. These are the work in blown glass and lenticulars. I think a lot of people know who they are. Uh, so we actually 
commissioned Selena Preciado, a terrific curator based in LA, um, terrific, terrific curator. We, we, thought we, we thought we were gonna open up the gallery in the Arts and Industries building, which is next to the Smithsonian Castle, right? Uh -huh. When we decided not to do that there and move it to the history, we had already hired or contracted with Selene to curate the De La Torre show. And then we said, wow, we've done all this work and we have nowhere to go with it. And then, we, and then of course, uh, I know Cheech, um, and when we found out that he was, you know, opening the cheats at Riverside Art Museum, we said, hey. <laughs> you want an exhibition? <laughs> you want this show? What if we, you know, we have a show that's uh -huh. it's coming along, it's baked, some of it's partially baked. Um, <laughs> why don't we, you know, you're welcome to it. And we worked it out. Selene agreed to do it. Um, and it took, you know, it was partially already funded. So that helped. Um, the artists are engaged. And they're terrific. The De La Torre brothers are crazy as heck, but they're wonderful guys. And uh, and so it worked out. So I'm that's happy great. that we were, we were able to collaborate with Cheech. Uh, and then, that, and that's why it's always important to, to connect the dots. And you know, we all know each other and and, and you got to connect the dots. That That's how we're going to do it. Exactly. Uh, you were, Abelardo, you had a question and then we should wrap soon. Sure, we got a couple more. Um, Barbara Carrasco, a good friend of all of ours. Do you we feel- We love Barbara, we love Barbara. Do you feel that the current administration will allow for enhanced support for your newest museum projects? Yes, it will. As I mentioned before, this year was a little hard on the funding because of the reasons that I indicated. Um, as I mentioned, the Congress has committed itself to funding the museum. And so I, I'm sure that the Biden-Harris administration will be very supportive of this, uh, of this effort. I see no reason why uh, for the next several several years, we're gonna get a steady stream of federal support that will also allow us to leverage private dollars. So I'm very confident. And yes, we love Barbara Carrasco. We have um, works of hers in the, uh, in the museum uh, and, and Harry as well. So in the Smithsonian American Art Museum and at the Portrait Gallery, so yes. All right, uh, from, from a good friend of ours uh, by the name of John Echeveste. Can you talk about the new play ball exhibit? Okay, yeah, John, I know John. He works at La Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> Trying to sneak it in there, huh? So no, um, so yes, play ball. <laughs> show that uh, addresses the relationship or it's about the relationship that the Latino community has with the sport of baseball. So it's about the big leagues, but it's more importantly about the community. And it's important, of course, to remember, you know, Fernando Valenzuela or Big Papi or whatever. And, you know, 30% of Major League Baseball players are Latino, Latinos, right? That's important. But it's also very important to understand the role of the sport itself, whether it's fast pitch softball or baseball, regular baseball or whatever, the role of the baseball has played in the formation of our communities. For example, citrus workers in Corona, California, right? Where the growers, farm workers, where the growers intend to use America's pastime, right? Baseball to assimilate and kind of keep things quiet with their workforce, right? Ah, no, teach them baseball, keep them busy, keep them entertained, whatever, and they'll be fine and they won't ask for much. Well, Turns out that the farm workers decided to use baseball as a way to organize themselves for better wages and working conditions. <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> or or the or the Mexican American war World War II veteran that returns to their home in Kansas City and wants to join the fast pitch softball leagues at the VFW Lounge Lodge and is told. I'm sorry, we don't allow Mexicans in our baseball league. So they said, well, thank you very much. They didn't say thank you, obviously, but they went and formed their own uh, baseball leagues and baseball teams and baseball leagues. And so here again, and they have baseball diamonds and parks named after important Mexican American community leaders on the west side of Kansas City, right? 
And you go, go figure, who knew they were even Mexicans in Kansas City? There's plenty of them, let me tell you. Yeah, so, a lot, a lot. And so, you know, these are people that were brought there for the railroad or meatpacking or whatever. So they have their own leagues, the teams, they call them Los Aztecas, Los Sabios, you know, whatever. And so they use the baseball to bring the community together after dealing with discrimination and racism. And so sure. those are the kinds of stories that are as equally important as Fernando Valenzuela's story, right? And so play ball hopefully will open, um, supposed to open, it was supposed to open last year, but the pandemic, hopefully it'll open later on this year, April, May. And then it's also traveling, it's a traveling uh, it's version. Open. Where, where, to, where uh, is it opening? Where is it? The National Museum of American History. <clears throat> just above our, where our gallery is going to be on the same wing. This exhibition is organized by M Margaret Salazar Porzio, who's a homegirl from uh, Boyle Heights. Her, you know, her grandfather was Japanese. Sound familiar? Yeah. You know, typical yeah. Boyle Heights story, right? Yeah. And so, you know, Margaret's doing a great job. Uh, Dodger fan, obviously. Um, you know, we're also going to deal with those whole stories of of, of, Cesar, of uh, Chavez Ravine, right? Which is a painful story, as we all know, but we need to tell it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a great, it's going to be a great show. It's a great show. Um, and the wonderful thing about it is also it's, it's traveling. It's actually opening in Saginaw, Michigan, I think next week is a traveling version. Oh. So we're taking that to, the beauty of the traveling exhibition service of the Smithsonian is that it takes traveling versions, reduced panel, mostly panel shows out to these small historical societies and places like Saginaw, Boise, right? That, that don't get a chance to have a sure. Smithsonian style exhibition or can't come to Washington, you know? And that's where the digital piece is so important, Dan. There's a lot, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks, a lot of Latinos in, 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 in LA, in the LA area, South Central, wherever they're you know from uh, that are never going to come to DC you know it's not it's just not going to happen yeah right yeah for whatever reason economic or family reasons or whatever we have an obligation to serve them regardless yeah. and that's why the traveling exhibition service is important that's why the digital work of the digital work that we do is critically important our outreach to the school districts that serve the kids in Hawthorne or wherever it is, or Downey or Norwalk or East LA or Boyle Heights or Lincoln Park, wherever. And so it's important for South Pat, wherever. So it's important for us to, to work with the student, with the school districts and the schools that serve our community and at least make our educational programs available to them in a virtual format. So, All right. Well, one, sorry, one last question here. Th thanks so much, uh, Eduardo, for your time. Uh, from Abel Ortiz, saludos from Uvalde, Texas. As we know, most art in art museums are a reflection of the people in power on museum boards. Is the Smithsonian doing anything differently to break this approach uh, by looking at artists in rural areas, not just the traditional large Latino regions? That's a really good question. Really good question. The answer is yes, and there's more to go. Yes, for example, we now, the Smithsonian American Art Museum now has the largest collection of US Latino art of any major art museum in the country, as it should have, as it should have. Carmen Ramos, who's our curator there, has just opened an exhibition called Printing the Revolution, Chicano uh, graphics, uh, graphic show, Chicano graphic show. Uh, I feel so badly for her because it was open for two days and then the museums had to shut down again. Oh, it's wow. an extraordinary show. I know Carmen, people, she's great. Any artist who you all know from LA and, oh, wow. and Texas. The point though that this, the caller is, I'm sorry, that the viewer is raising is a good one. What about Tucson? What about Albuquerque? What about Denver? What about Minneapolis, St. Paul? What about the Northwest? What about Chicago? And, you know, it, this was a very specific show because that was Chicano graphics, right? And whether, you know, I'm, unfortunately, the majority of the work that was produced are from California, Texas. Uh, that's, you know, 
<laughs> and I'm sorry, but that's but 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 that that's not an excuse. I think when we go forward, and we do, let's say, uh, discussions about Chicano art, we really do need to explore what's going on in a place like Omaha, or Kansas City, or Uvalde, Texas, outside of the areas around San Antonio, which Uvalde is near. So. You know, we do have an obligation to, to make sure that, yes, it's important to recognize where the production has been, you know, happening the most, that's for sure. You know, people need to know who Chaz Bohorkas is and, and you know, Patsy Valdez or whatever, right? But they also need to know who these other artists are doing this work. Carlos Fresquez from uh, Denver. You know, he's not on the major radar screen, but he's an important artist in the Denver community. <laughs> and he's been active for many, many years, including with Corque Gonzalez and the Crusade for Justice, which was part and parcel of the Chicano movement. So come on, you know, we have a, an obligation to dig deeper, which is part of the answer. All right, one final, final question from Armando Nila, Mr. Diaz, can I look you up for some salsa lessons? Oh God. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, come on, a no, little side gig not. on the weekends. No, no, no. That is, you know, I am not the person you want to learn from. My <laughs> sister is, but not me. Uh, All right. Yeah. Okay, well, well, we want to give uh thanks to you, Eduardo, for your time. Dan, as always, the great questions and the and the the conversation that we have is so enlightening to our viewers. Uh, that can, if you came in late to this uh, conversation, this happy hour, you can catch it on our website at lapca.org and also on our YouTube site, La Plaza. Uh, at La Plaza LA. Uh, let's see, Artur Rodriguez, gracias for wait, wait, before you go on, yes. I don't want to lose Eduardo here. I don't want to lose that because I want to thank him personally, obviously, for doing this. And I will leave you. Uh, with the words how you sign off in your emails, and that is que tu sol sea brillante. Brillante. Donatio, donatio. <laughs> An excellent donatio. Okay, yeah, exactly. Thank you, and thanks, Avelardo. I really appreciate it. Dan, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. It's always a pleasure to be with you, even if it's virtually. Um, um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a great thrill, and I want to thank everyone who tuned in, especially our folks from East LA College, and the Vincent Price Art Museum, Steve Wong, um, and uh, Barbara and Harry and everybody else who's been on the, and the alums of the program, Constance and other folks that were on the program, uh, tuning in. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's been great. Now Thank I can go to well. bed, it's 11.15 already over here. So. <laughs> okay, right. get your jammies. Well, Thank you so much, Eduardo. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was Thanks fantastic. Gracias. Okay. Bye-bye, y'all. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you to all our viewers out there at uh, via Zoom, via Facebook. Uh, we have just a lot of comments here, but no time because our time is running out. We got to get to our happy hour drinks. I know Dan's ready for his, and so is Eduardo for his. Uh, we'll, Dan will be coming by in a couple weeks, as he said, with uh, the incredible Chich Marin, uh, talking yep. about everything Chich Marin, including his new uh, museum that's opening up in Riverside pretty soon. I think they just got a million dollars from Riverside County or Riverside City. So he's, it's looking good out there. Anyway, uh, you could, we'll be back in Casa Con La Plaza. We'll be back next week, of course, uh, starting with our, our uh, Monday in Casa Con La Plaza Cocina. A little bit different this time. We'll have the, the folks from Cafe Cafe Mobile Coffee doing a a presentation, a demonstration on coffee and cold brew. So that's at three o'clock on Monday, January 25th. Also, uh, we have, uh, as you know, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes is the, the founder of the Eastside Arts Initiative, which is a, a grant making program which supports artists, arts organizations, and, and other institutions throughout Southern California. Um, this year, of course, because of COVID, we knew that a lot of artists and arts organizations were, were uh, falling behind on their revenue. So we put out a call to grantees to, uh, to step up, submit their artwork, submit their proposals, and we'll be presenting both on Wednesday and Thursday, our Show Your Creativity program, where the people who, who are the grantees that, were, that won a little bit of money uh, presented some videos. So we'll be streaming those videos on Wednesday, 
uh, the winners for the, um, the visual arts portion. And then on Friday, January 29th at seven o'clock, the performing arts. So we'll be hearing musicians, we'll be hearing singers, we'll be seeing some visual artists, apparel artists, photographers, and more. That's an En Casa Con La Plaza. You could catch the, the schedule on our website, lapca.org, on our Facebook page, uh, at Facebook, LA, at La Plaza LA. And that's it. Thank you to our sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, um, SoCal Gas, um, PepsiCo, of course. And thank you to Dan Guerrero for always keeping us informed, entertained, imas. Mostly imas. <laughs> Bye. Have a good week. Bye, all. Thank you for Zooming in and Facebooking in. Bye-bye. Good night, Dan. Good night, everybody. Buenas noches a todos.